Hey guys, before we start, a quick shout out to Alpha Dog Nutrition for sponsoring this podcast. Alpha Dog products are now available at dusupply.com and you can use code ALPHADOG15 at checkout for 15% off and a credit for free shipping to try it yourself. Now let's get you to your podcast. the worst when it starts making new noises <laughs> you know like the old noises you're used to and you can kind of just file that away is a <laughs> what we used to refer to as runner but watcher and then it starts turning into kind of a gar ar, 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 and i'm like eh, that's that's not good <laughs> yeah, but yeah when you sit you realize how much louder you're talking in your truck over the wheel bearing noise yeah and you realize the radio can't go any higher <laughs> you, you can't just drown that out anymore exactly so yep. what'd you do blow the ball joints out of yours oh yeah i mean it's just you know typical hunting stuff man the lowers were smoked and yeah so i put i'd put new lower control arms on and uh and new upper ball joints because i changed my upper control arms last year and those ball joints were already smoked so put new uppers in <laughs> I got a year out of them. It's doing good. <laughs> right, exactly. That's about what you figure. And uh, dude, yeah, man. my struts, dude. So I just put I on those um, Bill Steen fifty one hundreds. Oh yeah, and they're a year old. And uh, where that strut bolt goes into your lower was seized in there. I couldn't get it out of the bushing, so I had to take a ball joint press and press that oh. bushing out because I had to cut everything out put new bushings then so oh, geez. life in, life in the rust belt man yeah you guys out there you got it rough like out here because like you know i grew up in the classic car world like we did restos and hot rods and all kinds of stuff and it everybody called it oregon chrome you know because it was like <laughs> still shiny unlike what you guys got going on out there oh you guys will smoke a whole truck in a, like three years they're just rusted out gone <laughs> Oh, for sure. For sure. It's incredible. Like, I mean, you know, so here's the other thing. I mean, I I don't, I don't know. I mean, I've owned my truck for pert near 10 years and I probably washed it maybe five times. You're doing (laughs) good. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah, That's pretty good. That's the problem. That's the stuff holding it together. Don't wash it off. (laughs) Exactly. But I think I might have the only Tacoma on the road with the, original frame dude mine is yeah, right on the, on the recall every time it's gone in for it so we're doing good yeah you know what because all them trucks out there guys out here were were buying up dude like there in that stretch of period everybody on the west coast was trying to snag all these trucks off craigslist or whatever over on the east east side because they knew they were rusted to crap and i worked at the toyota dealership and let me tell you that was not a small job i mean you literally you're rolling a frame under it. Those guys were like, I figured two full days, you know, doing it. And granted they're hammering them out, but yeah, they'd snag them all up over there so that they could reap the benefit here and get a brand new truck out of the deal. Basically. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. I don't blame them, man. I mean, and that's the thing. I mean, as long as, you know, they stay good by it, I guess. I mean, it sucks for you guys that were doing it, but for especially us guys that are running them through the woods, man, that's a pretty good deal yeah. if you can get in the dream in a few years. Well, that's just it. And everybody's got their two cents on hunting rigs. Yeah, you know, like I was always a, a Toyota guy because that's what I that's what I worked on. That's what I drove, you know, like certain eras. I didn't want the way early stuff. I didn't want to own a 3.0. I didn't want the new stuff that was like making me cuss every day at work. So I'm like, okay, it's got to be between a 1996 and a 2001, you know, like, but <clears throat> That Dodge I've been driving, I mean, I've always been a Mopar guy. Like, that was my thing. But for a full-size rig and hunting, that thing has been killer. Like I was telling you, I need one set of brakes in 50,000 miles. Which, yeah, I, I've never gotten 30,000 out of a set of brake pads, you know, like through the woods. And right. uh, a wheel bearing and you know, maybe another one that looks like I got a dropper off, but... It never fails. That's what got me going on this is yours did it right before the field trial. You guys, or you had a swim race, right? Swim race. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. 
It was that through the Michigan Bear Hunters Association? Um, so that one, like we have, we were a part of it. We had our uh, our merchandise trailer and stuff like that. But that one's there's a awesome conservation club um, that's on the east side of the Lower Peninsula, and they host just an amazing field trial and swim race. And um, so they invite us there to have sell our merchandise. They donate a lot of the proceeds back to us. Um, oh, cool. It's a great club. Yeah, yeah. So it wasn't actually ours, but you mean Mission Bear Hunter's a big part of it. Right. And, uh, and then they ho- host another one that we were just at this past weekend, and that one was for the Michigan Hunting Dog Federation. So kind of same deal again there. Oh, did you get to see Thorman? Well, heck yes. <laughs> I haven't talked to him in a while. If he's listening, Mike, I miss you. We have <laughs> He usually calls with some kind of problem we're on him for like two minutes and then he's about his day. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah. I love yeah. Well, we got a trial this weekend. Well, actually I don't know when this is going to air, so it may be the week prior to y'all hearing this, but over in Prineville, cause those guys, I, that is a really fun trial, like for the West coasters the Prineville field trials, and then they're running the Oregon United sporting dog association state field trial at the same grounds in Prineville. And it's, okay. it's really cool. You know, big timber up. I want to say it's still in the Ochicos, like up outside of Prineville, Oregon, but like beautiful setting. They run through a lot of dogs pretty quick, Sweet. you know, and it's usually, you know, a, a bear drag or a cat drag or a Fox drag a big one. And then they do the field trial during the day. And they started doing like the three, three dog pack races and stuff like that, which is cool. If I had three dogs that would all come in and do what they're supposed to do at the same time. (laughs) All right. Right. But is that three dog like a short distance sprint? Yeah. It's the same as the, the regular field trial. So I want to say it's like, Oh, Wes is going to kill me if I say it wrong. So I'm just not going to, it's short. I mean, like it's not a hundred yarder dash, but I mean, it's not the three mile bear race yeah, yeah. or something like that. It's, it's pretty quick, but do you guys do that out there? Or is that a lot of clubs out here on the West are doing the three dog packs? Okay. Or five. Yeah. yeah I was going to ask you what, what your guys' stuff. No, like most, I mean, I think there is one club that does do a uh, uh, a dry ground race, but like most of our races are all swim races. Oh, so, which we don't like, hardly have out here. I mean, there's a couple in California, and I guess in Washington too, just not Oregon. Okay, yeah, and so I mean, what we're doing, I mean, like the coon clubs, they'll you know, I mean, have used to have like a coon in a cage and stuff like that, but I mean, with like the bear dog ones, it'll just basically be like a bear archery target with a bear hide on it and they douse it in bear scent and it'll be on a cable system and keep it just above the pond level right. and the dog want to shoot, you know, and, uh, they throw the shoot once the bear gets out there. And I mean, it's the race is on, man. So they're using a bear, like a bear mannequin for the, the swim races. Yeah. That's awesome. Cause used to, I mean, I, I don't know. I, I haven't been to any big ones. You know, except for out here in California, but like the swim races out there seem to be huge. And it used to be like, what, a PVC float or something. They'd make like a little float and then they'd have a cage Yep. and they'd pull it across the pond and then it would go up a tree once it hit the end, like it'd ramp up to the tree. But you guys are doing a bear mannequin. Yeah. Yeah. And then that cable system, then it's going up to a tree, you know? And so, I mean, yeah, it's cool, man. And then uh, it's scored on. So there's like a line right before the edge of the pond. There's a rope across. So you got, you know, I mean, you're placing dogs on when they cross the line. And then you'll place them on treeing, you know, first dog right. to the trees. So just because they cross line first doesn't mean they're going to be first dog to the tree kind of thing. Yeah. Yeah. Those dogs come in gassed. And like, I've watched it where those dogs that are way out front. You just sit there and stare at it, you know, <laughs> you're just waiting yeah. for him to bark. Yeah. So our swim race is here so that we always have, uh, they always have youth events at it. So the kids get to take, you know, their dogs and handle them and put them, 
go in the shoe, you know, I mean, and swim their own dogs, which dude, that's like, I mean, these kids are just beaming doing that, you know? Oh yeah. And, uh, they, yeah, it's pretty fun to watch. It, they're more fun to watch than the dogs. <laughs> oh, absolutely. They are, you know? And, uh, and so it's like, and then you get all ages too. I mean, you start getting like these kids that are in their early teens. I mean, and some of these kids are really able to put a handle on dogs, man. It's, it's awesome. You can tell the ones that have been, they're really passionate about it. It's fun to see. And you see where the time spent, you know, right. Like who's putting in the time and, and kids have a way. I remember like one of, I don't know if it was the first issue or second issue of the magazine, but somebody wrote an article, uh, God, I hope it was you, Corey. I, w- I want to say it was Corey Groover, and it was titled Train Like an Eight-Year-Old, like getting back to the roots and like the innocence of a child and like everything that they would do to just put into a dog. It was it was a pretty cool story because they'll do anything. They'll drag a scent hide around. They'll do all kinds of crazy stuff if you just turn a kid loose with a dog. Oh, yeah. Yeah, man. Like, I've always, I've always wanted to have like a, uh, host like kind of like a small field trial thing here in my place and it just mm-hmm. a youth only event thing and have a couple things oh, you, you know i mean tree competition stuff like that but the biggest thing that i wanted to have was for like the final test you know or whatever of the day was a talent show because you know kids oh. dude, they're always making their dogs do something ridiculous yeah right you know i'm like training them you know whatever the case may be and I just think it'd be, yeah, I mean, just a lot of fun. And yeah, I mean, get good youth involvement, man. That's, um, somebody else was doing like a handling event where it's like you had to, I can't remember if you had to collar the dogs up, but like you had to collar them, I think, turn them loose, recall them and get them back in the box. And it was who could do it the fastest, you know, as a handler, which I thought was a really cool idea. Oh, that's a super cool idea. I mean, I'm glad I don't have to participate in something like that because I'd for sure lose that. Because <laughs> your kid's been slacking. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it's my kid's fault, not my dog's fault or my fault. <laughs> yeah, right. Oh, man. Well, so are you, I mean, I, I don't want to like bring this down a notch, but you you just recently lost a pretty good dog. Yeah, I did, man. Are you rebuilding? Yeah. Oh, yeah. I mean, I've. So here's the thing, like, I mean, it, it never is easy losing a good one. And especially like one of that caliber. I mean, I, I don't know if I'll ever replace legendary that. is the title legendary bear dog. If, according to Mr. Steve Fielder. Right. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, I can't give enough thanks to Steve for that. Um, but so I was set up pretty good. Like, as far as going into losing him, fortunately, like I had, Mm -hmm. like I had a very good pack dynamic going in. Um, so it's not, I mean, it leaves a huge hole, but like, I'm not worried about having to restart. You know what I mean? I'm, I'm in a good spot to keep moving forward. Um, but, uh, dude, it, it definitely sings. And I mean, and like I was telling Steve, like when we did that article, you know, I, he was just my buddy, man. And that's mm-hmm. as much as I'm going to miss having him in the field. And on the days when you really had the tough track and it was like, okay, pull hatchet out of the box. Cause you know, we're going to get jumped here. Um, I just miss him being around with my buddy. Yeah. That's how it was when I lost Henry. Like he was. I don't want to say one in a million, you know, and I, I probably have owned dogs that were better at some parts and, you know, but the likability factor is a lot. And when I spent that much time with him, like I grew a ton with that dog. He's, he's one of the only ones that I never farmed out at some point. Like I used to yeah. put my dogs with guys that were hunting hard and, and have them start them and things like that. But he was the only one that I held on to 100% of the time. And uh, you just build the bond with him. It's totally, totally different. Oh. And I know, like, that's just something, unless, I mean, our listeners get it because they own dogs. But, like, if you're not in this, you don't understand. Right. 
No, you don't. And it, it's crazy too. Like those dogs, they get to where like, I mean, obviously, I mean, we know all dogs can read body language, language and things like that, but it's like that dog almost knows what you're thinking. Oh yeah. You know I mean? Hatch and I could walk to the woods together. And I mean, it was like, he knew when, yeah, I mean, like what I was trying to do, I never even had to say anything to him. Right. And yeah, I mean, we're in, he'd get her done. Yeah. Well, and that's kind of what I was hoping to talk about. Everybody's probably covered the subject of what makes a bear dog. Like, but that's got a billion different answers. Everybody's different. Yeah. But, you know, Hatchet was, I mean, by reading the article, man, it sounds like he was a, a heck of a dog. And I know you've talked really highly of him for years. But Steve did write an article about Hatchet in the legendary Bear Hounds column of Bear Hunting Magazine. And, like, buddy to buddy, I, like, I like talking to you anyway. <laughs> I've had a lot of people <laughs> comment, like, our last episodes, you know, they're like, oh, you finally found somebody that likes talking to you. But I just thought, like, your unique perspective on it, because we've both been there and having to not necessarily rebuild, but forge on. Yeah. Like, what what are the biggest things that he left a hole on that you think other dogs are going to have to step up or are there things that you're trying to specifically work with, you know, one of your younger dogs on it, you think there's going to be some holes or you think they're filling in pretty good. Uh, there's definitely going to be holes, man. Like no question. I mean, just because he really was that caliber of a dog to where, um, you know, it's probably going to take me a long time before I ever see another one like that. Now I've got, yeah, I've got dogs straight off of him that in my pack right now. And this one male I've got now, Poncho, I mean, he's, he is, he's exceptional. And, yeah. uh, he, you know, I mean, he really rises to the occasion, but what he lacks right now is that he doesn't, I mean, he's, you know, he's got plenty of experience, but he's still, you I mean, he's a three-year-old dog, but like Hatchet had so much more experience to where, I mean, it was like, he just knew sometimes the way, like with a bear, like the way a bear would travel. And, you know, even when he couldn't smell a track, he would just put himself in the area where bears would be. Where he knew they were going, where he knew they were going and he could, then he could find a track and we could get a bear jumped. And, uh, yeah. and that's some brains. It is man. And, and I can see, I, especially this poncho dog, I can really see poncho developing that, but it's going to take him time. And, and I know that didn't, oh, yeah. you know, it didn't come overnight with hatchet either. Um, but that's going to be, that is going to be a tough one, but I, I, that poncho, I've leaned on him pretty hard these last couple of years. Cause no one hatchet was getting older, especially during training season. I mean, I wouldn't run him much because I mean, if he caught a bear, yeah, I mean, we're right. It, it was going to get rough. Yeah. I mean, then I'd have to lay him up anyway. And, uh, right. And so, um, poncho's really, he's, he has rose to the occasion. Um, but, but there's going to be those holes. And then the other thing is, you know, right now I'm in, we're in the, what dog's going to raise, rise up to be the leader of my pack. Yeah. I mean, cause Hatchet was the elf. I mean, obviously I'm the alpha of my pack, but as far as my dogs go, like, he, he, was, he was second. <laughs> Let me throw that in there. Yeah. We know who's boss. <laughs> right, exactly. But I mean, he was, you know, and so you so see, you have that pack dynamic and I see that in the, in my dog yard, you know, and it's kind of like, they're still trying yeah. to sort that out. You know, nobody's really sure who's who's in charge yet. Isn't that funny? And, and then it's like, I mean, at least, like, I've been through this, well, twice, I would say. Like, noticeably lose, hands down, the most experienced dog in the pack. You know, the the anchor, the one that holds it all together. And it's like, once it worked out really good, like, first trip to the woods, and I'm, I'm going out there with a the mindset of like, I'm screwed. This is going to be a complete disaster. We're going to go run around and it's going to be crazy. Nobody's going to, you know, step up. And it was like immediate. And you notice it like 
second time, third time, fourth time, it's like, holy cow, no, we're, we're right back up to where we were, if not better, you know, like they, they weren't honoring something else and they could move past that. And then I've had others that it's like, man, it was a struggle. And then it just flips a switch. Like one day they just decide, oh, okay, here we go. And we start running like a pack again. Yeah. Oh yeah. And, and I know it'll happen. You'll be in good shape. Um, but it's just kind of one of those things. Yeah. I mean, it's just the dynamic, small things that you take notice of when that, when that, when that spot's missing, you know, or, or, or vacant rather. Yeah. Um, but a big area where I'm going to miss where I, I'm going to struggle, I should say is cat hunting, man. Um, yeah. Hatch, it was, he was a very good cat dog also. And the reason why the rest of my dogs are not, up to where they should be as far as that goes is all my fault because you know i've got young these last few years you know i've got young kids i can make up a million excuses our winters haven't been as good on and on and on and on but at the end of the day it was just my laziness because i'd get out there i'd have a little bit of time and i knew that if i pulled that dog out of the box and put him on a cat track we're gonna have a race right instead of making the others work right yep and it was like man, let's just go have a race. Yeah. Uh, and so that that's on me. That's tough. Um, but that's really tough though. Yeah, it is. It is. But, um, you know, I'll, uh, I got some puppies that would be, uh, like grand pups to hatch it. And, um, a couple of them are, I'm real excited about them. <laughs> that's always a good feeling yeah yeah it was uh, so what about like y- your pack structure i mean because obviously we all try to keep dogs spaced out right like i would say the biggest hindrance i've ever had and i still do it time and time again was more than one puppy right i tell myself i'm not going to do it this time and then sure as, you know you're going to do it but like i remember starting off and you just load up with dogs and you weren't oh, thinking yeah. anything about it. You just wanted dogs to go hunt. And now it's like, well, crap, my two-year-olds are now six. <laughs> like time flies. Right. And you got like the next round and you try to space it out. Do you try to add a pup every year or every other year so that when something like this happens, you kind of got a a structure? Yeah, I do. I try about every other year is kind of where I'm at, where I have a pup to where like, and it depends, I guess, on when they're born to, you know, I mean, how old the pup is during season, things like that. You know, there's a lot of factors, but I like the every other year kind of thing because then yeah. it allows you a year to get them started and then a year to hunt the guts out of them to really right. get, develop them. And, uh, and then, then, so then it's like, okay, you got a dog that, you know, you can actually kind of have some rely on a little bit and then bring a pup, you know, now we'll bring a couple puppies on or whatever. Right. That's just kind of, I don't know whether it's right or wrong. That's what, how I do it. <laughs> that's, that's how I try. I mean, I went there for a stretch and we tried some dogs that just, you know, they weren't going to make it, uh, you know, not saying they weren't going to make it, but they weren't going to make it here because fancy and Rose, they, and Twitch. I mean, really, those three girls set the bar pretty high for like the exposure that I've given them lately. Cause I'm like you, you know, I've been slacking too between kids and business and trying to get dogs out. And it's just, I didn't get to hunt like I wanted to this year, which is the story we all have probably every year, no matter how much we hunt. But I was getting to a point where I'm like, oh, shoot, the pup's three years old and I haven't done anything you know so i i had a litter last year i guess she was two and i i I like keeping them two years apart if i can but this year i'm pretty loaded up i got one that's just turning two one that just turned a year and then i'm getting ready to pick one up that's like 11 12 months old too but i figure man if, if one or two of them make it out of that batch you know i'll be good for another two years that'll give me one more breeding off of what i got and then they're retired and but then 
you know, Murphy gets involved in everything that can go wrong. Will and exactly, you know how it is. <laughs> yeah. Oh, dude, I do. And I mean, you know, and part of the thing is too, like, um, yeah. I mean, I bear hunt hard still, and I've been able to do that, and that's really, I mean, uh, why I kind of embrace it. It's a, you know, it's easier to get the kids out because, like, we cat hunt. We only cat hunt on snow. And right. Yeah. I mean, so trying to take the kids and get everybody going, then we've got short days and all these things. It's, mm-hmm. you know, you start stacking up on you. And then it's like hell, half the time our snow is all ice it's garbage. Yeah, exactly. And yeah, I mean, you're tearing dogs up if you try to run on it. And yeah. uh, where's the bears? I mean, geez, Pete's, I can usually go make something happen. Or, <laughs> right. You can find a bear. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, we can we can usually manufacture something, even if it's raining and, um, it's just easier to get everybody out there. So, I mean, I can, I can stay in the woods, you know, more days a week than yeah. they should be. And, uh, so like you say, hatchet was your best cat dog too. I mean, like how, how did he do transition it over? Was he a better bear dog than a cat dog? Or like, I mean, there's always that the battle between guys, right? Like, well, all around dogs are the best. Okay. But there's usually they're stronger in one than the other, you know, and to take a bear dog that is a really good cat dog. I mean, that really is kind of needle in the haystack. It's not around every corner in everybody's backyard. Wouldn't, would you agree with that? Oh, for sure, man. I would absolutely agree with that. And he was definitely like, make no mistake. He was definitely a better bear dog. And I w- you know, I said it even when I was hunting him hard, um, that I would never call him necessarily a cat dog. We caught a lot of bobcats. Right. Yeah, I mean, we caught a lot of bobcats. But he was a bear dog. It, you know, and uh he now he came out of, you know, some good cat dog breeding. That was um kind of the thing where he came from, but he was definitely he was a bear dog. Yeah. And, uh, and you know, had I, I mean, who knows, maybe I could have brought, you know, developed him into being a better cat dog than what he was. But I mean, as it was, he made me, uh, he, he, made he me was happy. plenty good. Yeah. He was plenty good, man. He was very reliable. And go catch cats for as much as I could. Oh, that's nice. Yeah, especially I know like this winter, everybody I talked to out your way, they said it was just horrible. Like, you know, no snow or the snow was garbage. And sometimes it just doesn't line up. It's hard enough yeah. trying to find a puppy. Like for me, it's like, okay, I want something that when season rolls around is eight to 10 months old, like ideal. So you're trying to f- time everything and you just hope everything lines up. But, you know, it, I'll preach it. The breeding behind it is everything. I mean, it sounds like you got a couple off a hatchet that are, you know, going to live up to the legend, but it's, it's hard. That's only part of it. And you got to hope that that carries them through. Like when you guys like you and me are slacking, (laughs) you know, it's like, at least they're bred good enough to, to know what they're doing and try to make up for lost time. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. And yeah, I mean, those, those dogs have got off and are, I mean, they're, they really are something too. And I mean that, uh, well, that poncho dog of mine there out of his litter, we only had four pups and I kept a male and a female, my female. She's, she's a very, very good bear dog too. And my hunting partner, he kept a male and female. So there was two and two. Um, and all How'd you do that. <laughs> dude, I mean, it was complete luck. That never happens. Yeah. And uh, all four of those dogs are just fantastic. I mean, they we've really leaned on them hard, and they've all rose the occasion to the point where last fall we lost Dale's mail. I mean, got on a rough bear, and those dogs have no quit. Tell and, me somebody named one Lefty. Oh, I've you got, got one named Poncho. I've got Poncho and Lefty. That's what I was going to say, man. We've been holding <laughs> on to that one until we did a pair. Yeah. Yeah. So well, yeah. how are they? bred? I mean, can you talk about how they're bred? You said they were cat dog bred, but yeah, where do they come from? 
so they're they're like a heavy ray bread blue tick is uh what they are mostly and that's um it's a a line of big game blue ticks from i mean more or less developed here in michigan and uh are really sought after um in this area i mean michigan wisconsin i mean guys want these dogs pretty bad and uh i've heard that name a lot yeah yeah they're known really known for their grit and their speed um which they have that and uh in and then he's he i mean that was that was hatchet's breeding you know uh pretty much through and through and uh um a good friend of mine who uh he he owned uh hatchet's uh dam and she was easily the best cat dog i've ever seen hit the ground i mean she was the real deal mm-hmm. spin a cat down every time she went out of the drug blue dog too yep yep and she was ray red blue tick and uh Dang. and she had been kind of yeah i mean her breeding yeah i mean back up to that was kind of it was always pushed more towards cats i mean they're also bred for bear hunting but i mean you know kind of with you know cats being the forefront of it sure and uh yeah i mean they it so that's that's kind of the the line of dogs i'm running i mean now like that poncho and lefty um their mom was like half cameron half smoky river and uh yeah and so then we bred that yeah i mean obviously made that with the ray cross and i mean they threw some nice nice pups um obviously i mean we're hunting them hard and those puppies that i have now then um we line bred back so i took my lefty dog and i bred her um would be um back into like that ray side so it'd been hatchet's full litter mate been a pup off of her that we brought her back to so oh so keeping it pretty tight yeah yeah i mean and they they're real they're nice acting pups man i mean i spread them out amongst my hunting group and uh everybody's pretty pleased with them so we're gonna see that's what they do here it's always good yeah yeah i I mean they're they're eight months old so we're gonna roll into training season i mean like how oh, they're ready here. Oh yeah. Yeah. There was a lot of that. Um, so like the blue dogs that we were running came from, from Brett Williams out in Idaho and they were, you know, mainly Cameron and Uchman crosses. Yep. You know, Hawk and cheater and scout and all oh, went back to all oh, the dam went back to, I think North Star's Blue Honey was her name. She was like a top 10 Purina dog. So, I mean, it was like, it was put together. Yeah. And then once it hit me and a couple of other guys, you know, they went one direction with the Smoky River. And I stayed to the Cameron and Uchman stuff. Because I'll be honest, I like the look of the dogs better. I like a dark, dark dog, mahogany trim, you know, like a, a blue, blue dog. Not okay. Not all blue, but. Um, you know, as they got older, they dang near looked all blue. They'd gray out and, but you know, I was never able to reproduce Henry. Right. Like he was, a, a f- in my mind, he was just one of those dogs that you don't see often. Like when he'd hit a track or he struck a, a track quote unquote, like it didn't matter if it was under the truck or if it was 600 yards up the ridge, like he went to where it was and started it. It it just didn't matter, but I never had a dog off of him be anywhere near that to be real honest. Right. So like for you to get that out of him, and that's what Brett told me. He says, man, your best dog isn't always your best reproducer, which is a hundred percent true. Cause I mean, I still believe in breeding the best to the best and the compliments, you know, get dogs that compliment each other, but you think you got a grand slam and then mother nature rears its head and, (laughs) <laughs> you you got something that isn't what you were expecting right right exactly you got four of them yeah so you're doing pretty damn good man um, yeah i mean there was a lot of luck there though you know too i mean we and all we did with that cross was just bread best to the best 
that, you know, and it's how we got it. I mean, and that's typically, you know, I mean, you try to look at the breeding, you know, when I go, when I breed, you know, look at the background of the dog and try to be breed for the best of the best, just because I got to have sure. my bets a little bit, man, you know? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Right. Especially when you got kids involved, huh? It's like, you're real leery about bringing puppies home. All right. Right. Yeah. And if I didn't have dog on work getting in the way of everything. Yeah. You're, you're a busy guy. Yeah. We've been trying to schedule this for a couple months. I just <laughs> yeah. figured you weren't taking any calls from peasants once you uh, were in the limelight. <laughs> well, right. Exactly. Yeah. It became kind of a big deal. So <laughs> your wife messaged me and she's like, you should talk to Elijah. I said, I've tried. He doesn't deal with peasants anymore. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> but you guys you got training season coming up right does it start in july yeah yeah so ours here in michigan starts july 8th and uh i mean we're chomp well the dogs are chomping at the bed i can tell you that much and i mean we're pretty excited too but it's like my wife can attest yeah. you know, i got there's only a couple months of the year for me to get projects done so it's like because once july 8th hits man all bets are off yeah, isn't that the worst part? Like spring is the busiest time of year, and it's when you should be out working dogs, and you got a <laughs> list of honeydews. <laughs> right. Yeah, but I'm doing pretty good this year. I'm checking off the list. I mean, that we're we're doing pretty good. I think I'm gonna be sitting pretty good by the time training season gets here. So. Yeah, you got the dogs all trimmed down, or they still got their uh, their winter coming off a of winter weight. Oh, no, I've had them on Weight Watchers. They're looking pretty doggone good. <laughs> <laughs> Did you do, do the wrestler dump? Like, oh, shoot, season's coming. We better t- cut weight. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. And uh, That's the worst. You know, I, we'll, uh, we got a local club here that we can go swim the dogs at. And, I mean, that oh, nice. tremendously to get them in shape, especially before training season. And that swimming so good for them, man, because it's low impact. Yeah, I mean, so oh, and it makes them rock hard. Yeah, exactly. You can muscle them up hard, get a good lung on them without just beating up the bodies, you know. And uh, so, yeah, I'll start now that we've rolled into June here. We're going to start swimming and swimming the snot out of them, get them in good shape. Yeah, I wish we had a place to swim dogs. It would be really, really nice because, like you said, it puts it on them. It cuts fat real quick. Yeah, because I'm playing around with. I'm in the middle of switching dog foods. So I'm like, right. You know, you're in that limbo time. We're like in, we're in dog food purgatory. Cause it's like, they're just still finally switching over and I'm not really doing much running. So I don't know how it's going to go, but <laughs> that's what you, I, I'm hoping. I mean, I'm, I'll be honest. And then they're not sponsoring this podcast, but you and I have been talking about the dog feed yep. off air. And, um, I ended up when, when buddy got that truckload of a nook shook in, I took a, a pallet of that for some, some guys down here and I'm putting a couple of older dogs on it to try it. But that other one I was talking to you about that next level pet food, that's, um, that's when I'm shifting most of the pack. Like, you know, the seniors, I I'm trying the nook shook just along with some other supplements. Like we're running the alpha dog stuff and. I'm just trying to preserve the inevitable. You know, they're six. They're at the tail end of their prime and sitting the way they are. It's, you know how it is. Getting a dog in shape is tough. And yeah, just don't, I want to get the most out of them I can because I enjoy hunting with them. Like they are some of the nicest dogs I've ever been able to go out with as far as just go enjoy it and not worry. And like you said, like Hatchet, you turn them loose on a cat, it's going to go get it going. Right. It's, uh, but I'm trying both of those and I've been, I've been impressed with both of them. Um, so I'm going to keep you posted on that. I know you said you were thinking about making a switch too, but I'd, I'd look at, I mean, I, obviously I'm not endorsing. <laughs> I guess I got to say this. I'm not paying bills here, but I was, I was really impressed. Like when you opened a bag of the Anukshuk and I opened a bag of that next level, like super impressed with the quality and like the color it was consistent, you know, both of them. So I'm kind of doing a blind test, you know, we'll run them on this and then we'll switch them up. But 
Yeah, that was a major truck of dog food, man. <laughs> yeah, that's what it sounds like. Yeah, I'll be interested to hear how oh. the Pepsi family goes on the dog food here because I, uh, you know, I mean, I, I really am. I'm interested in both of them. And, you know, obviously we want to keep the best fuel we can in our dogs, you know. Right. And it's not like the yeah, it's um, that old Roy. How has it been out there for you as far as getting dog food, though? Like, have you guys been able to get your feed consistent? I've noticed, like, here, you're lucky if they got it in stock, you know, and that's why I wanted to get a pallet, you know, so I knew I had the same feed because I never switch them from summer to winter. I just adjust feedings, you know. Yeah, that that's how I feed, too. And so I I honestly cannot tell you how it is. So we've got a feed store um, that's fairly local. It's like 25 miles from here. And, uh, they keep it in stock. And I mean, they haven't told me otherwise, you know, if they've been having a hard time getting it, but they cater to hound hunters there. Um, it's a really, oh, good, perfect. it's a really good spot. And, uh, yeah, I mean, so it's good to give them the support when we can too. And, uh, sure. And so, yeah, they, they don't, they haven't like, if I call and say, I need a ton of dog food, they say, okay. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, that's right. We had that, we had a semi truck delivered to the shop, you know, because Buddy's selling it up in the store. And I pre ordered a, a pallet and a half and drove up there. And the truck driver, let's see, I left on Tuesday night. He was supposed to be there Wednesday. And then got hung up in Pendleton somewhere. So I'm like, crap, I got to stay another day. I just gotten home from camping with the kids and stuff. You know, I've been sleeping on the ground for four days and I was done. I rolled into to Washington. This is how I roll still. I get in there at like, I don't know, two in the morning. <laughs> and I'm like, I am not getting a hotel for four hours. This ain't happening. So I pull up to the shop and slept in the back of the truck. Oh, I'm like, crap. I got another night. I got to hang out. So I worked in the shop all day, which is. It's always good, you know, because oh, I don't get yeah. to see those guys very often, uh, especially with us. You know, we, we seem to have a baby every couple of years. So <laughs> I've been spending a lot of time at home. Right. But, you know, then, then we find out the trucks broke down. I'm like, crap, here we go. So we, we were sitting around and buddy, he took pity on me. He's like, why didn't you say anything? I'd get you a room. Let me get you a room for the night. <laughs> so he put me up in the hotel and the next day I show up and. <laughs> We're going about our day and we get this message. The truck driver broke something on his trailer, his seven pin connector. He's in your area. I said, you find that truck. And I'm going to go steal that shit. And we're going home. Exactly. Like, I'm, I'm ready to go home. I'm going home tonight one way or another. Like it's either with right. a ton of dog food or it's not. I don't care. I'll come yeah. back up. <laughs> no, Luckily they made it. And, the crickets. Dude. No, <laughs> no. I was ready to go home and find my own bed. Because I'm like you, man, it's springtime. Like, we got lambs coming. We've had, you know, kid goats. We got, it's spring. We're super busy. So, I'm like, thank God this truck shows up. So, we unload all these pallets of dog food and loaded it up in the truck. And, you know, it's stacked. Shoot, three feet, four feet above the cab. You know, I mean, like, quad cab, Dodge 3500. And I'm like, that ain't going to make it. Like, it might make it down the road, but there's this thing between buddy's place and mine called, you know, the mountain ranges. <laughs> it's like, dude, there's no way that's going to make it going up and over the pass. Cause it's pretty windy. <laughs> so I'm sitting there stripping bags down and I got it packed in and it literally filled the entire full size pickup bed from bottom to, to rail. And I had them kind of stacked in there. Goofy. I got so many funny looks on the way home, but I mean, that truck was literally hauling a ton of dog food. Just, bombing down the freeway you know that's awesome man but that's a lot of dog food man i will say like storing it that's the hard part yeah oh yeah and keeping the mice out of it yeah i'll bet you guys got to deal with that real bad huh yeah yeah we definitely have the mouse problem so i store mine in the like food grade plastic barrels with screw lids that's what i use yeah what i was doing too yeah this year we we took the pallet and we did uh 
like a horse. I don't want to say a horse stall mat because it's not that big, but like the gym mats, that same material. It's like what half inch, three quarter inch rubber. Yep. So I had to unload everything by hand because I don't have a forklift or nothing. So I unload it all in my shop, stack it on the floor. Then I move the pallet over and I put one of those pads on it so nothing could get up through the slats. And it really surprised me. Like they didn't even hit the sides of the bags out of a whole pallet. I had one that had a corner chewed and that was it, you know, out of 50 something bags. I was pretty surprised, but I think it's because they couldn't get up in. And, you know, when you stack them, they've always got that void in the middle. And I think they just get in there and they just start eating. And I don't know. I, I got really lucky. I'm hoping, hoping it's the same. We, we put ours in our, our box truck this year. We got a old Grumman box man that we just, Loaded it with dog food and figured we own it and it's free storage and there ain't no mice. So (laughs) it'll be worth it. Yeah. Yeah. You guys' mice must not be very hungry out there. No, we keep them pretty knocked back. (laughs) You have to. And if you got chickens, you got mice. You know what I mean? Oh, yeah. It's a never ending battle. Plus, we got a place behind us that's total tweak down, man. Like. Uh, burned out motor homes and you know super nice neighborhood and just this place that's generationally been just this dive yeah. running drugs and all kinds of crap like it's either the staters the medics the fire department the power company somebody's back there all the time yeah. but god dang they breed feral cats man uh, they're just coming out of the the woodwork all the time so that's helped keep them knocked back the downside is the feral cats running around are not real fun with the hound dogs. So every time I kick them loose to run out to the truck, I'm worried we're going to find one. <laughs> yeah, exactly. That's why I don't keep any cats around here. Part of why we have a little bit of a mouse problem. But yeah, the feist dog though that she's definitely you're telling me, dogs, man. Elijah's got a new hobby. Yeah, yeah. Get get started into it, man. Yeah, a little murder. That's exciting. Fight. Y'all can't see it. He's smiling ear to ear as soon as he talked about that dog. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I, I'd be lying if I said I wasn't excited about it, man. It's I think it's going to be a lot of fun. And it's just another, yeah. another way to keep my kids in the woods, too, you know? That's what Trigger was supposed to be. When I got him, I'm like, oh, he's going to be, you know, I'm going to run him with the hounds and I could run him on coyotes or whatever. Cause he was like a giant beagle, 17 inch crossed on a, a, what was it? A f- f- whip it? No. Yeah. Whip it and pit bull terrier. And he got the build, you know, he looks like a racehorse and he, I'm like, Oh, he's going to be gritty. He's going to be eating everything, you know, rats and squirrels and whatever. No. Didn't work out. He ran pretty good with the dogs for a while. Like he he ran some bears when we could still do that, and he ran some fox. But I always thought it'd be cool to have just a little. Everybody wants a truck dog. Like truck dog to me encompasses the feist. You know, we had a cur dog that used to ride shotgun with us all the time, and it's like just the utility. There ain't nothing else going on, so let's let's kick this thing out and see what exactly, happens. Exactly, dude. I mean, because there is that type of dog where. They're going to make something happen. It's like in them. They can't help. Them. Right. Yeah. Yeah. They're like, but super loyal, right? Like super good family dogs. What I keep hearing. Yeah, man. Like we've been joking around. I mean, it's not that we really have a farm here. You know what I mean? But we've got some critters and stuff around. And so we're like, she's the perfect little farm dog. Yeah. I mean, she, she hangs out like doesn't. I mean, like she'll go out, you know, into the woods and stuff like that but she's never going far and she's always back you know i mean somebody pulls up the driveway and we got a pretty long driveway and yeah you, know, you know what i mean she's out there <laughs> <laughs> and uh, the squirrel dogs are intriguing to me like i've never been into them there was a guy out here i know i've told this story before but you're gonna hear it again uh he brought in some cur dogs in the eighties and they were using them for, for squirrel hunting or um, bobcat hunting here. Cause oh, they made really good locate dogs in this tall timber. Yep. But like those feist dogs, the more I see it, cause 
I don't, I'm not trying to plug me again. I'm really bad at this. I'm going to sound like an advertisement. <laughs> <laughs> but like, you know, my first real introduction to squirrel dogs was a, my uncle back in Michigan. I just knew he always had one. He always kept a squirrel dog and a rabbit dog. And that's just, you know, that that's how houndsmen out there were, you know, rabbit season is like as big as opening day of deer season almost. Yeah. Especially and, in the uh, southern part of the state, man. Yeah. And that's where he was down around like, well, Jerome, um, Yep. I actually ended up meeting one of my relatives through this podcast. I was talking about my uncle Jim and I get this phone call and this guy's like, Hey, you know, you talk about your uncle, who was he? And I told him and he's like, no way. Shawnee and Brandy's and Jenny's mom or dad. I'm like, yeah, yeah. What's going on? And he's like, dude, I'm your cousin. And like, we literally <laughs> met because he listened to our podcast and he's a customer of mine, which is that like is to me, awesome. crazy small world. Right. And he's sending me pictures of my uncle Bill and, you know, it, it's really cool. But, you know, that was my first taste of squirrel dogs. And then I just never thought about it. Cause in the mountains we're at, I'm like, I'm not chasing no dog after a squirrel. That is crazy. Like I just, <laughs> I'm not going to do it. But, you know, since we took over full cry it, and getting more, you know, squirrel dog stuff, uh, you know, it used to have a ton of it, but we've been really trying to get good, good small game content too and space it out but you start seeing these little dogs and it's like dude i could totally see packing one of them around on the center console and they just seem to be like the most chill like hey i'm just here they're following along you know and then you turn them loose and i just think it's really cool so i'm excited to watch how you do this and i want like the real version of was it worth it i don't feel like they're like a terrier like i don't think i could do a terrier they're just too intense for me. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And I agree with you. Like they're not, they are They're. I think they are more chill than a terrier. And, but dude, I can tell you like the ones that, I mean, I've hunted with before, like owning one, they can be rough on game though, man. I mean, they'll get like bay and bay. They'll get right in there on a bear bay. Isn't that crazy? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, no fear. And, uh, um we'll see it's fun like ours is dinky though like she's super small even for a feist I, and i don't know why but i mean i uh i'm definitely gonna have to get a and i hate to even say that but i'm gonna have to get a 25 for her just because yeah you know i mean like my x count my 15 x's won't fit on her won't fit. Next to her. yeah so now i got yeah this collar on the smallest dog yeah, and you know, since the minis are all discontinued, right. I mean, really, it, it, it's a better collar. Like I will say, hands down, those twenty fives will smoke a mini because we just see so many of them fail. You know, like yeah. even replacements that go out to people, it's like this one failed too. It's like, yeah, it doesn't surprise me. Like for some reason, they've just been real hit or miss, and yeah. they're not that much bigger. Like you, you've had a mini before, haven't you? Yeah. Oh, yeah. 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 No. I mean, I and I've. I and, thought you know, so. I've just drugged my feet on the whole twenty-five thing. I should have already owned a few, but don't you know. don't be scared, man. Like <laughs> honestly, it's they had very little problems out of the box. I mean, yep. I'm not going to say some didn't. I had two fail personally, um, but overall, yeah, it's money well spent. Don't don't waste your money on like a used mini go straight to the the 25 with that mini strap that's exactly what i'm gonna do you know is yeah is, is go that route and i guess how small is she dude she's dinky i mean like five pounds yeah i'd say right there between really? four and six pounds no kid that is kind of small yeah they're usually like eight to 12 pound right i would think yeah. just by looking at them yep Yep, she's 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 little even for the breed. But I mean she's put together well, man. I mean, she's a beautiful dog. And uh yeah, yeah I mean she, cause she's hunting and running all the time. I mean, she's just like one solid piece of muscle. Right? <laughs> <laughs> you, you gonna run her on bears being that small too? Oh yeah, I mean, I'm not gonna Yeah, yeah. I'm not gonna hold her back. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> 
just, just wait till they're bait and send in reinforcements. Exactly. Yeah. I mean, I'll let her do what she wants to do. I mean, because that's the whole thing. Like I said, it's going to be cool having a little truck dog, you know, riding around on your shoulder and crap. That, that's your catch dog right there. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. <sighs> yeah. Well, shoot. Because your guys, I mean, squirrel season's big out there, isn't it? Like, even where you're at. Yeah. You got what? Eastern grays and fox? Yep. Yep. Exactly what we have. Yeah. And it is. It is. And we've got a, I mean, a pretty liberal squirrel season, really. I mean, starts like September 15th, which I mean, here it's it'll still be like 85 degrees, you know? And then yeah, it, you don't even eat them then, do you? No. No. I mean, I wouldn't probably wouldn't. Wait till the freeze. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And then I don't even know when it ends, to be honest with you. No, we're like a real short season. It's like a month. And it's really considered like big game. It's in our big game regulations, which is crazy. Squirrels? But yeah, it's yeah, Western Gray Squirrel. It's all in the big game regulations. Whoa. And it's like, what is it? I wanna say it's almost six. It must be six a day. I think six a day and you can have two bag limits in your possession. So that's what the kids love it. Cause every time it opens up, we'll just start rolling around the mountains and, you know, looking for squirrels. Good excuse to get out of the house and go drive around. But, right. Right. Man, if you got a dog, I, I could see it being a lot of fun if you didn't have to hike these mountains here. Yeah, dude. I, I would probably agree with that. <laughs> <laughs> you get her tuned up. You bring her out here. I'll take you hunting. <laughs> Oh, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I'm thinking, uh, yeah, we'll probably do a lot of hunting right from the truck, so. Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> well, before we jump off, man, is there anything new or uh, upcoming with the Michigan Bear Hunters you want to talk about? I know you're, you've been writing your updates in the Bear Hunting Magazine, and but you guys got any fundraisers or events coming up you want to get the word out about? Um, well, we have, uh, the Michigan bear hunters sponsored, uh, um, swim races coming up and, uh, that'll be at the clam river coonhound club. So anybody that's in, uh, Michigan, if they want to come out to that, man, that's, that'll be, uh, June 20 second, I think somewhere right in there. Look it up. If you go onto our Facebook page, you'll be able to find the exact date. <laughs> Don't trust <laughs> Elijah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, that's kind of our next biggest thing till our, our annual convention. Um, we've got our 52 gun, um, gun drawing going on right now. Um, so we're getting tickets sold for that. Um, and that's a cool deal. That, like explain that don't roll over it too quick because like for guys that have never bought a ticket into something like that, you know, California houndsmen do it. We, we usually buy tickets for, cause I mean, you guys literally give a gun away a week. Yeah, exactly. To a different so winner, like. Yep. Yes, yeah, so we sell a thousand tickets, um, and we give away fifty-two guns. So one gun every single week of the year, and uh, yeah, I mean, we just it just based on so how we base it is on the uh, Michigan lottery. So when they have the lottery draw, um, the numbers that are drawn there, and they draw every Friday, those that winning number is the winning number for that week's gun. Hey. There you go. That's a good way to do it instead of asking Siri. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> and you got a record. Like, that's smart. Right. Yeah. I mean, I was not the brains behind that. Sorry, long before my time there. So I, I can take no credit on that. <laughs> we knew that. <laughs> Don't worry, bud. <laughs> well, and then the banquet you guys having it up in, was it Traverse City? I'm going to butcher that, huh? No, it's north of that. That's where we ended up. Yeah, you guys flew into Traverse City. Yep, and it's just north of that. It's in a little town called Bel Air. It's at Bel- Shaney Creek. That's it. Shaney Creek. Yep. Which is a cool little place. Yeah, it is. It is. It's cool because we can do it all inclusive there. You know, yeah. I mean, so like, obviously, our... Um, our convention's not like Wisconsin's. It's structured differently. I mean, you've been to both of them. Um, yeah. So, you know, I mean, we uh, so we can keep everybody in one spot. Your hotel room's right attached to the whole convention center. So, I mean, you can it's get pretty as wild. Nice. Yeah. 
it was it was cool. I mean, because it is definitely different. And we had, you know, you know the travel accommodations for that <laughs> yeah. trip. I it went south in a cool. hurry. But yeah, the good news but is you don't have to worry. Done. The good news is you don't have to worry about getting to the Traverse City Airport before seven AM because I don't think they're open. There ain't nobody there. Like <laughs> I'm the no, only dude. one in that airport, dude. <laughs> exactly. And next time you guys come, we're going to have you fly into Grand Rapids. It's a lot better ordeal, and I'll just pick you up and go for you. Yeah, at least Buddy got to roll around and BS with you for a couple hours. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah, he got oh. to come hang out at my crib and everything. Yeah, right. <laughs> and when when is that coming up? Uh, you guys just had it, didn't this you? Small- yeah, we just had it. So we have our convention. It's uh, the first weekend in March every year. Um, so, yeah, we're, we're, you know, obviously it's a, you know, you kind of have a year long planning process with that. Um, and, uh, you know, we're keeping a close eye on state capital in Lansing um, and yeah. making sure that uh, we're, you know, getting the things knocked down that need to get knocked down and, promoting what we feel needs to be promoted and it's uh that's kind of a never-ending thing and a lot of it that uh you know mike thorman does so much for us all for all the hunting dog groups in the state um and so much goes on i mean he's swatting so much stuff that never even sees the light of day and people never hear about and um it's really a, a thankless thing that he does and um we wouldn't be here without him doing what he does there. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. It's amazing. If people knew the work that was going on behind the scenes, it would be just baffling, you know? Yes. And that's what it takes is relentlessly staying on it too. You guys are really lucky to have someone like Mike out there. Yeah, we are. And, um, you know, it's going to take, uh, an army to replace him. I mean, because, He's, uh, he's not getting any younger and, um, the rest of us are, you know, at a point in our lives, we're really busy too. And so, um, when he finally is ready to hang his hat, it's, we're going to have to really pull together on it. Yeah. Yeah. You guys are going to have to delegate. (laughs) Right. Right. Exactly. But no, but other than that, man, for anybody else that's out there listening, I mean, join your local organizations, join your state organizations, you know, I mean, get out there, be active because, um, you know, Michigan, we're a referendum state. Uh, so we get the worst of the worst thrown at us all the time. And I know not every other state's a referendum state, but I'm here to tell you that the antis, they want to end all hound hunting. And it doesn't matter in a referendum state or not. It's just that we'll be the easiest yeah. ones to crumble. And so be organized, you know, support. Um Go to W's, join the fight page, get on it, um, because it, we need the strength everywhere. Yeah, and, you know, I see so many orders come in from people that, you know, you see them buy a membership times three. You know, they're they're doing WBHA or Michigan or Idaho or, you know, and they're out of Kentucky. Like, <laughs> Yeah. I mean, I had a guy he called one day. He's like, I can't bear hunt here. I just want to support these guys, you know, and you, you subscribe or pay your membership for like three, four different clubs. And it's, it is good. Support your neighbors. I mean, we, we may all be across the country from one another, but God dang, man, like we got to stick together and support the guys when they need it. Oh yeah, absolutely. I mean, that's, that's one thing I feel is the hound hunting community as a whole. We're really good at. And that's, uh, yeah. you know, uh, putting our money where it needs to be and supporting one another. And, uh, we just gotta, you know, we can't rest on our laurels. Everybody needs to continue to do so. And I mean, because I make the joke all the time, especially as bear hunters, you know, across the country, I mean, we're all just removed by one person. It's yeah. like, I mean, you can talk to anybody in the country and, the, you know, you know, you have someone in common, right? You know. And I mean, I think that's the whole hound hunting community is really that way. Yeah, I agree with you. And it's cool to see. I mean, what other groups? I mean, even just as sportsmen, you know, I'm not going to say 
sometimes people go overkill on the we're divided, we're divided. And I'm not going to say we're not. But on a whole, I think that there is a big shift from sportsmen in general. Like, especially being involved more in the media side of things now. I, I mean, think of podcast and how many are out there. And like now we're launching these episodes on the Sportsman's Empire Network. Because like mainstream is starting to see a value in hounds. You know, in fact, I'm going to be doing a podcast with, with Dan over there um, about that. You know, and it seems like there's a shift and it's like, I really feel like we're gaining ground because I haven't ran into a deer hunter in years that, you know, cussed you out or gave you a bad time for being in the woods. You know, it's, it's like, we're starting to see this shift where like, we all do realize we're on the same team and that's in the end, that's, what's going to save us. We, we got to be respectful of everybody and we got to just take help where we can get it. And if we can put our best foot forward and keep doing that and support them, I mean, really like support their groups, go join Rocky mountain elk foundation, you know, or joining the Oregon hunters association again, you know, get involved pheasants forever, whatever it is. If you're an upland big game, we're all on the same team and, and they're going to remember when they see a donation come in, like, cause we used to donate all the time, Oregon hunters association or, like now you'll see states, you know, we're sending money to, to Maine when they needed it. Or, you know, yeah. people are sending money to California to fight the battles. It, it's a tit for tat without keeping track. It doesn't matter what the bill is, right? Like we're all trying. Oh, USDA just sent a bunch of money to Colorado to help them fight what they got going on. It's uh, it's a good thing, man. Like I think you and me and, and guys like in our generation age bracket, whatever you want to call it, we're like really in a unique spot because you remember old school, but you oh, can yeah. see where things are going. And it's a really yep. interesting time right now. And it's cool to see. It's exciting. Uh, I just hope we can keep things rolling and support your clubs. People support your neighbor's clubs too. <laughs> they need it. <laughs> yes, absolutely. They do. Yep. It's uh yeah, you said it perfectly, man. We need to support each other. Well, I appreciate you uh, supporting the podcast and, and calling in. <laughs> because I've been trying to get with you forever. I saw that article come out, and I'm like, oh, i got to give him a bad time now. He's like going to get a big head. But, no, that was a great read on Hatchet. and I, I appreciate you talking about it. I know a lot of guys don't want to talk about it, but... Like we were saying, it gives people a perspective because there's a lot of guys listening that haven't been through this, right? Like we're fortunate slash unfortunate that we, we had to. And oh, it, yeah. it, it's just, uh, it's a big deal, man. Like you lose something like that. You don't forget it. And, and that's what makes them the legend. Like yep. everybody exactly. listening, you will have your own legend. It, it's, uh, if you're doing this for the right reasons and your heart's in it, you're going to have that eventually and if you haven't found it yet just keep digging because it's down there oh man yeah there, there's no question about it and uh yeah you just gotta you gotta keep rolling man yeah saying <laughs> well, <laughs> just keep rolling man you got training season starting we'll touch base once we get through i want to hear some squirrel stories this fall too <laughs> we'll, we'll bring your little dog out here <laughs> Yeah, I hope I have some for you. Hopefully they're not all porcupine stories. I'm good at those. I'll take those. Those those will get better listens. You just send all the porcupine stories over, man. <laughs> oh.